I'm looking at trying to find what are the hopes and aspirations of people that are behind the choices they make. And that's quite a tender subject because it, that's why I wanted to reverse that idea of sneering because you ask people what their taste is and often they'll start by listing all the things they hate. And I thought that was kind of, that had been done. I mean, there was that brilliant series in, in the early 90s, Sign of the Times, that was kind of, a, you know, it was a cringe fest. It was a brilliant series, but it was a cringe fest. And I, I thought that, that it would be interesting, in, you know, in, a, in this time when, when perhaps we are, and whether we like it or not, or, or whether we are aware of it or not, I think there is a kind of bleed in the class. Things are becoming more egalitarian, perhaps not in the way some people would like, you know, because some people might call it a dumbing down. Um, some people might see the sort of crass, you know, market-driven taste of certain people dominating our cultural landscape. But I just wanted to reflect what was going on now, really. How it happened was when we chose the places, because we chose the places Sunderland, Tunbridge Wells and the Cotswolds, because they were the kind of cliché sort of uh, destinations for the certain classes. You know, the North East is heavily associated with working class culture, so we went there. So we went to Sunderland because it wasn't Newcastle. And then when we got there, we realised, oh my God, you know, it's a very white place. And so is Tunbridge Wells to a certain extent, a very white place. And the Cotswolds is, is an almost entirely white place. And so, yeah, and there is a debate to be had about class and race, for sure. And I think often they get conflated because a lot of the prejudice that uh, ethnic minorities receive, I think, often is mixed in with class prejudice, particularly around things like employment and education. I think that's where it really gets conflated. When I was talking to people up in Sunderland, what I should put on the tapestry to represent working class taste, time and time again, they came up with shipbuilding and mining. And I said, but they don't exist anymore. You know, they're a ghost. And of course, they are a ghost in the kind of collective unconscious of the people. And uh, when I met this guy, Sean Foster Connolly, who's a, 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 a singer in a working men's club, you know, and he was kind of... Um, talking about his time working in the shipyards and his, his father and mother being singers in the club and the long sort of industrial heritage of it. I realised that what I was dealing with in a lot of working class taste was this kind of ghost from the past that has kind of carried on in the kind of social, emotional structures of that society. And so a lot of the kind of working class identity was formed in the kind of crucible of those heavy industries. But the industries have gone. But of course, the emotional feelings and patterns and, uh, and uh, priorities within that community have continued on for a long time. I mean, you know, we can make intellectual decisions very fast. You can say, close that business. That happens overnight. But emotions change very slow, particularly in societies. And so you've got this kind of ghost of the working, you know, that kind of old working landscape. And I understood that it could be dismissed often in the media as sort of sentimental and kind of mawkishness, but it plays a role, it works for them, you know, it, it kept it going. When we were in this um, new development near Tunbridge Wells called Kings Hill, which was a fascinating place, fascinating place, um, we went to a Jamie, Jamie Oliver at home party which is kind of the modern incarnation of Tupperware, in a way. You know, you, you, an agent comes with a selection of kitchenware and home goods, and they do a little demonstration, and you, and you have a glass of wine, and you talk about it, and, and then hopefully buy some. And um, when we were talking to, the, to these women about um, Jamie Oliver, it became very apparent to me that he was kind of like, he was selling class mobility to a certain extent. You know, he's a bloke who puts himself forward, whether he is or not, I don't know. A real geezer, you know, working class Essex boy who's done really well. And he's got good taste. He's got better taste than most middle class people, you know. He's got lovely things, he's well styled, you know, and he does lovely food. And you're thinking, that's what he's kind of represents. So in my tapestries, I put him as the god of class mobility, sort of smiling benignly down on the, on the people as they kind of move up the class ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he thinks about it. If there is a kind of one point that comes out of the entire series, it is that good taste is that which does not alienate your peers. And so for all groups in society, you're kind of unconsciously kind of adjusting and nudging your sort of outward exterior appearance and your persona and the signals you're giving out 
to kind of fit in with the groups of people you want to fit into. And of course, where the real drama happens is when people want to change the group they move into, and that often happens around university and education and career and things, and people are trying to adjust themselves. And of course, that's, the, that's when the potential for getting it awfully wrong and things can, go, can happen. Um, and, you know, that's with, like in the film, there's a, I get a, an aristocratic lady to take me to a gentleman's outfit to sort of dress me up as, as, as a posh person to go to this sort of lunch at a castle. And I asked the owner of the castle, you know, who's like incredibly aristocratic guy, I said, well, do I look up a class? And he kind of looks at me up and down and goes, well, you look very smart. <laughs> it's a no then, you know.